You'll be turning in your Bibles to Psalm 145. Psalm 145. <clears throat> Charles Spurgeon, the great British pastor, has said that praise is our dress rehearsal for heaven. Praise is our dress rehearsal for heaven. In heaven, our main task will be praising God, according to the Bible. While I do believe that we will do work in the new Jerusalem, um, we will feast, we will laugh, we will celebrate, we will renew friendships, our main goal and occupation will be praising God. Uh, Psalm 145, as we near the end, just two more Sundays of uh, preaching through the Psalms, as we near the end, Psalm 145 is the last Psalm in the Bible for two specific reasons, um, or two specific things. Uh, summarize it as one of the, uh, as the last Psalm in the Bible for these two particular things. First, uh, for those who are interested in such things, geeks like me, um, this is the last acrostic um, psalm in the Bible. That is, this is the last psalm in the book of Psalms where each verse begins with uh, an alphabet letter of the Hebrew uh, alphabet alphabet. Uh, Aleph, Beth, Gamel, et cetera, et cetera. So each verse here um, starts with a different Hebrew uh, alphabet letter. Um, verse 13, since there are only 21 uh, verses here, instead of 22, verse 13 has two letters uh, together there. You might remember, um, again, for those who care about such things, that uh, Psalm 119 was probably, is probably the most uh, notable acrostic psalm where six verses uh, in each section, each section beginning with a new Hebrew alphabet letter. But to me, the more fascinating thing about Psalm 145 is simply this. It is the last psalm of David. The last psalm that David wrote, this is, perhaps we could be so bold as to say and to speculate that these are the last biblical words David wrote under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So if this is the last writing of David, what would be his topic? What would be his subject? What would be his theme? Well, if you know David, if you've studied him in men's uh, Bible study, or if you have followed through the Psalms, you know that if we're looking at David, we're probably praising God. And this Psalm, as one commentator has written, is a monumental praise Psalm. It is fitting to end uh, one who wrote more than half of the Psalms or half of the Psalms just to end with such words. David had learned his entire life about the character of God. This one who was a man after God's own heart. And so his legacy that he leaves to you and to me in many ways is Psalm 145. Let's stand together as I read this psalm. We believe and we teach that the Bible is the inspired word of God, his only rule of faith and practice. And as Ezra had the people, we do also stand in the reading of his word. Hear the word of the Lord, Psalm 145. <clears throat> I will exalt you, my God, the King. I will praise your name forever and ever. Every day I will praise you and extol your name forever and ever. 
Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. One generation will commend your works to another. They will tell of your mighty acts. They will speak of your glorious splendor and of your majesty. I will meditate on your wonderful works. They will tell of the power of your awesome works and I will proclaim your deeds. They will celebrate your abundant goodness and joyfully sing of your righteousness. The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and rich in love. The Lord is good to all. He has compassion on all he has made. All you have made his will praise his, will pray all you have made will praise you O lord your saints will extol you they will tell of your glory of your kingdom and speak of your might so that all men may know of your mighty acts and the glorious splendor of your kingdom your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and your dominion endures through all generations the lord is faithful to all his promises loving toward all he has made the lord upholds all who fall and lifts up all who are bowed down. The eyes of all look to you, and you give them their food at the proper time. You open your hand and satisfy the desires of every living creature. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and loving toward all he has made. The Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. He fulfills the desires of those who fear him. He hears the cries and saves them. The Lord watches over all who love him, but all the wicked he will destroy. My mouth will speak in praise of the Lord. Let every creature praise his holy name forever and ever. Father, we ask now that as we have read and as we open your word here, we pray that your spirit would speak to us in the time of our lives. The quietness of this place, O oh Lord, open up your word to us. But may we see no man save the Lord Jesus Christ only, for it's in his name we pray. Amen. Be seated. <clears throat> David opens this psalm. In the first two verses, by proclaiming that God is king. God is king. David was the king of Israel, as you know. It's my senior Bible students. We almost on every test talk about Saul being the first king, David being the greatest king, and Solomon being the wise king. David was king of Israel, the greatest king of Israel, but he knew no matter what his earthly title was, that there was one above him, that there was one beyond him, greater than he was in every way, that Jehovah was the true king. And because God is king, David brings praise to him in a psalm that really opens up the attributes of God in many ways. Praise is worship. Uh, every week we lift our voices in praise. We lift our words in prayer in praise. We expand the scriptures in praise to God, for praise is worship. David says that he will praise God every day, forever and ever. So I guess the immediate question right out of the box on this particular hymn, this particular poem, this particular psalm is, is it routine for you like David to praise the Lord every day? Has it, has it just become a time when on Sunday you come and bring praises to him or is it an everyday activity as part of your devotion, as part of your prayer time? Do you praise him? One of my mentors uh, would get up every morning and say, this is the day that the Lord has made and I will 
rejoice and be glad in it. Praising God from the very time that his feet hit the floor. And so the question becomes, is praise part of your routine? As we have just finished up with Thanksgiving, <clears throat> I think it's a natural question for me to ask you. Our hearts have been warmed this week as we have perhaps stopped for a few moments and thought about the many blessings as we, if we sat with friends or family around the Thanksgiving table. Uh, the prayer was said, thanking God for uh, those particular uh, bits of praise that we have. And yet, does it fade away now that Monday's coming and we're back to a normal routine? Is it we come back to a routine where every day we, we get back into the things that we do normally? Is praise going to be part of your routine? Is it a life, you live a lifestyle of praise? David then, as he begins saying that he will praise the Lord every day, he moves into the reasons that he is thankful. And these should be your reasons as well. Are you thankful to God for these reasons? Verses 3 through 6, David is thankful to God for his Greatness. He sees the greatness of God in all of his works. In fact, the word works occurs three times in this section. Mighty acts are also listed here. Uh, great deeds. David looks all around him and he sees the hand of God in everyday life and in creation. And he praises God for his mighty works. Yet, I would say from where we sit today on this side of the cross, that the greatest gift, the greatest work of God is our salvation in Jesus Christ. So many of us take for granted our salvation. We barely sometimes remember that time in our lives when we didn't know God. For those who have walked with Christ a long time, it has become such a way of life that sometimes we forget to praise Him for that greatest work. Certainly, in David's day, the greatest act of redemption that we find in the Old Testament is the Exodus. But here, on this side of the cross... We are to praise God for our own salvation. His greatness enabled you to be saved. Verse 4 says that we're to tell of every generation about Jesus Christ. We're to preach Christ crucified and raised from the dead, the conquering power of God over death. Look at the way David describes God's greatness. He uses these words. No one can fathom God's greatness. No, his mighty acts proclaim it. The splendor of his majesty proclaims it. His awesome works and his great deeds. So I ask you, does this type of praise come from you? Do you ever stop in your daily time with Christ or at any point in time during the day to praise God for all of these things, for his mighty works, his mighty deeds, his awesome works, his wonderful works, his majesty. <clears throat> Are these a part of your daily routine or do you just take these blessings for granted? This time of type of praise should come from our lips all the time. I can't help but read verse 4 and think about our baptism today. One generation will commend your works to another. They will tell of your mighty acts. They will speak of your glorious splendor of your majesty. Here we had two parents this morning coming, covenanting before God to raise this next generation 
in the fear and admonition of the Lord, to, to talk about the great things of God that God has done in their lives and to pray that this little one, this beautiful little girl would be raised up to come to know Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior. Yes, she enjoys the benefits of the covenant family, but the prayer is that one day she would commit her life to Christ. One generation telling the next generation about the great things, commending works of God. It's often said that the church of Jesus Christ is one generation away from oblivion. And while there's a lot of untruth in that, for God governs His church and the very gates of hell will not prevail against it. It is true that one generation must teach the next generation so I ask you, if you're a grandparent, how are you doing on that? If you're a parent or an aunt or an uncle, how are you doing on that? Are you having these types of conversations with your children, your nieces, your nephews, your grandchildren? One generation will tell the next about the kingdom of God. The next thing that David praises God for after he's praised him for his greatness is the grace of God. The grace of God. Look here in verses 7 and 8. What we see is David passes these good things on to us. He talks about God's goodness, his graciousness, his compassion, that he is slow to anger, that he is rich in love. Verse um, Eight here is almost an exact mirror of what God tells Moses in Exodus 34. Exodus 34 verse 6 says this, that as he, God, passed in front of Moses, he proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abundant, abundant, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands. Certainly we would expect a strong God. If we were talking about a God this morning, if we were to pass out slips of paper to everyone here this morning and um, ask them to write down attributes of what they think a God should be, certainly... Uh, everyone would probably write down powerful, right? Everybody would expect a God to be powerful. We would perhaps expect a God to be wise, strong, to carry the natural attributes that we would assume a God would have. But who in their right mind would write down that a God would be merciful and gracious? And yet that is the God we serve. That his countenance, his character is one of grace, is one of mercy. When Moses asked God, uh, when God had told Moses he was sending him back to Egypt to bring his people out, Moses said, who am I to say you are? What is your name, in other words, that I can go back and tell my people when they ask, who told you all these things? What am I supposed to say, Moses says. And God says, you tell them my name is I Am. Right? And what does I Am mean? Well, I Am means the very things that we see here. Gracious, compassionate, slow to anger, rich in love. That's the God that you serve and that I serve. There's also an emphasis here in these words on the eternal kingdom of God, the rule of God. Verses 12 and 13 speak of this, this everlasting, glorious splendor of a kingdom. Verse 13, your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. Your dominion endures throughout all generations. 
when I read those verses, I'm reminded of the story out of Daniel when Nebuchadnezzar stands on his balcony and he surveys all that he has made in Babylon. And he said, oh, how great all of this is. It is all due to my splendor, to my works. It is my, to my glory that Babylon exists. And even as those words are leaving his mouth, God judges him such that he drives him out into the forest and the fields to eat of the ground and to live as a wild animal until he finally repents and returns. And when he repents, Nebuchadnezzar comes back and in Daniel 4, 34, he says, I honor and glorify him that lives forever. You see, even Nebuchadnezzar, the great king of Babylon, Babylon, the greatest kingdom to ever exist on this earth, even that king, the one who brought it to its ultimate pinnacle of success, came to realize that he did that only by the hand of God and that it is God's kingdom that endures forever. Do you think you're the king, you're the ruler of your own life, of your own family, that all you have is because of your hard work? Think again. Think again. God gives you all that you have, and without his good gifts, you would not have anything. So not only does David praise God here for his <clears throat> greatness and for his graciousness, he praises God for his faithfulness. Here, beginning in the last part of verse 13, the Lord is faithful to all his promises and loving towards all he has made. God is the provider of all good things. He notes four things that God does for his creation here in this ver these verses. He helps the inadequate in verse 14. In verse 15 and 16, he gives food. In verses 18 and 19, he answers those who pray. And in verse 20, he protects his own. Notice here in this section of five or six verses that the word all appears 11 times. The Lord upholds all those who fall. He lifts up all <clears throat> who are bowed down. God is faithful. His caring extends to all that he loves. Verse 17 points to his righteousness. He says, God, the Lord is righteous in all his ways, loving towards all he has. Certainly God's righteousness encompasses his morality, right? The Bible answers four main questions Origin, meaning, morality, and destiny. And certainly, God's moral character is beyond anything that we can even imagine. But I think here, the psalmist is referring not just to his moral character, but is referring to God's, um, the fact that God is just and he is upright. That he leads God. In the right way, he watches over all of his children, verse 20 tells us. Well, then David brings his last verse that we find in all of Scripture in verse 21. This is his legacy. This is... What David wants you to remember, if you don't remember anything else that he has written. He has given us the reasons to pray through God's character. And yet he brings this invitation here at the end. My mouth will speak in praise of the Lord. Let every creature praise his holy name forever and ever. Legacy is an important thing. We talk about it 
from time to time. What is the legacy of your life? What will you leave to the next generation in your family? We have multiple parts of Isabel's family here with us today. What is the legacy that each one of them will leave to her? What is the legacy that you will leave to your children or your grandchildren? What, when they think about your life, when your nieces and nephews perhaps think about their great uncle or their great aunt that they loved so much, what will be the one thing that will pop to the top of their mind? David wanted his legacy to be that he praised the Lord all the time. That he was mindful of his God's character. That he, even as king, served under the great king. So as David passes out of scripture here with verse 21... I would just ask you this morning, what is the legacy that you will leave to those who will follow you? Will it be a legacy of praising God? May each of us be able to say, when that day comes, my mouth will speak in praise of the Lord. Amen.